The Gospel of John really is a feast. You may be seated as we prepare for the preaching and teaching of the Word. Where would we be without the fourth Gospel? It's all about Jesus Christ being the Son of God and the Savior of the world. And most of us know the Gospel of John because we love to quote John 3.16. I mean, if that's the only verse of the Bible you know, that's a good one. And most of us at least know that. Well, well, we all know Jesus wept because that's the shortest verse of the Bible. We know, and that's in John. That's John 11.35. But we'll actually be in John 3.16 tonight. I believe, uh, uh, who has that tonight? I, was it Dana got that one? But we're in John chapter 3 tonight. Oh, what a chapter. And uh, teaching, preaching for us, these are three heavyweights. I tell you, get ready. Chuck Smiley, Dana Wallace, and Robert Moon. You're going to be blessed. I'm going to enjoy all of this tonight. Chapter 3 of John, we'll be covering verses 1 through 15. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. That is the son of man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must be the son of man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So over the past few months, We've not only been battling the coronavirus, but the ugly injustices of racism have reared their ugly head. Now that we have been battling for years. On May 25th, 2020, we witnessed a video that will be etched in our minds for years to come. The events that unfolded on that momentous day served as a great signal of distress for millions of African Americans who have been seared in the flames of withering injustice, as well as millions of Americans who refuse to allow this type of inhumane behavior to claim the life of another black citizen. In the video, Mr. George Perry Floyd Jr., also known as Big Floyd, cried for help and and his dead mother as his life slowly slipped away while being arrested by four Minneapolis police officers. Now, I love our police, and this is nothing against them because we understand that even a few can taint the whole system. So this is not against the police. 
This is about racism and the ugliness that many of us face. The video shows Big Floyd being handcuffed face down in the street while three officers on top of him with one leveraging an unauthorized tactic of kneeling on Mr. Floyd's neck during the arrest, which later caused him to die from mechanical asphyxia. George Floyd's death sparked nationwide protests and riots in over 400 cities across the country as veteran activists and newfound allies alike rallied to the cause of rush, rush, excuse me, racial justice and equality for all. The vast majority of the protests have been peaceful with simple demands handwritten on torn pieces of cardboard. Enough is enough. Stop killing us and justice for George Floyd. Those pleas have resonated around the world producing expressions of solidarity and unity from Europe to New Zealand. Yeah. Dr. Martin Luther King once said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects us all indirectly. The world needs more of us than ever. And when I say more of us, I'm talking about Calvary Gospel. I'm talking about more churches where people like us from all different genders and nationalities and races pray together, worship together, and serve our God. They need more of us on today. We need to relentlessly tell them about God's infallible word that became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We need to tell them about the glory of the one and the only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Think about that, grace and truth. That's something hard to do. How can I be graceful but also tell you the truth? Because they said the truth hurts. But it don't hurt if you use grace. Amen. Honestly, the truth is we are called to love our neighbors as ourselves. Because if we don't, we will never be able to win souls for the kingdom. Who are our neighbors? Everyone in this room is our neighbors. Not just the people we live across from. Not the people we just work with. But anybody we encounter. Those are our neighbors. For us to be successful in executing the Great Commission, those we are witnessing to must be able to see a difference between us, the church, and this forsaken world. This difference will only come through a renewal of our minds and a transformation of our hearts. Jesus explains this renewed spirit with Nicodemus in our text. Now let's go deeper into the word. In verse 1, it says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, but no one can do what you're doing unless God is with him. In verse 1, we obviously meet our first character, Nicodemus, and then we also meet our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To under understand the significance of this dialogue, you have to understand who Nicodemus was. He was a wealthy, educated, and very influential member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. He was also a Pharisee. Pharisees were spiritual fathers of modern-day Judaism, and they believed that all Jews must strictly adhere to the oral and written laws given to their forefather Moses. Now look at this, though. Look at this. Nicodemus comes to our Lord under the cover of darkness. We learn that Nicodemus seeks out Jesus because he and his colleagues wanted to know if he was the Messiah. That's truly why he was there. They knew about all the stories and what God was doing and how Jesus was healing the sick. But their main question was, are you the Messiah? Because we got to know. So Jesus was a rock star. And so with that fame came a lot of envy and a lot of jealousy. But here you meet Nicodemus, who's humble, coming under the cloakness of darkness to talk to our Lord and Savior. Instead of Jesus answering the question, he challenges Nicodemus' perception of the law by saying this, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He doesn't even answer his question. I know who I am, but do you know who you are? Jesus replies to Nicodemus, shattered 
the Jewish assumption that their racial identity, being Jews, was their old birth. It assured them, according to, to Jewish law, that they already had a place in God's kingdom. And Jesus is saying, oh, not so. Jesus made it plain that a man's first birth does not reassure him of the kingdom. Only being born again gives him that assurance. Nicodemus, puzzled by Jesus' response, asked, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Personally, when I read this text, I thought Jesus was messing with old Nick. <laughs> After doing some extensive research and some laborious work, I realized the importance of the words he used. Now, let me break this down for you. In the Greek language, the word, again, has three different meanings. It can mean from the first time, like the beginning. It can also mean for the second time or a repeated act. And lastly, it can also mean from God above. Jesus once again challenges the substratum of Nicodemus' religious beliefs because he wants him to answer or to consider all three of the meanings at once. When a man is born again, there must first be a full change. The birth will be like being born again, except this birth will occur more in a spiritual and mental form. And finally, this birth will come from God our Father who sits high and looks low. To put it plainly, Jesus is saying, if you are not born again, you cannot enter into the gates of heaven. In Acts 2 and 33, we learned we must repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of our sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We learn in Romans 6 and 23 that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In verse 5, Jesus doubles down on what he said in verse 3. Except for this time, he adds even more details. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it. But you cannot tell where it comes or where it goes. Excuse me. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Now, let's check out Jesus' phenomenal wordplay in this. He starts by saying, most assuredly, can just, I can just visualize him saying it today. Look, bro, trust me when I say this to you. Jesus was emphatic in saying that man does not simply need a, a reformation or a reformation, but a radical, radical transformation by the Spirit of God. He then begins to explain to Nicodemus how to enter into heaven. First, Jesus says, you must be born of the water and the spirit. Now, there's a lot of debate from biblical scholars and theologians on what is, bit, uh, what is meant by being born of the water. Some think it means to be baptized. Some think it means our physical birth, since we're birthed in a sack. Personally, I believe it means to receive the water of cleansing that is prophesied in Ezekiel 36, verses 25 through 28. Since Nicodemus is a religious scholar, Jesus knows he will be well-versed with the Old Testament and quite familiar with this text. The text reads like this, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove you from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws, then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors, and you will be my people, and I will be your God. Jesus goes on to say, which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Jeremiah tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who could know it? Therefore, a transformation can't be physical. It must be spiritual. Now, let's examine what Charles Spurgeon says. His view of being born again goes like this. A man may cast away many vices, forsake many lusts in which he indulged, and conquer evil habits. But no one in the world can make himself be born of God. Though he should struggle never so much, he could never accomplish what is beyond his power. And mark you, if you could make yourself be born again, still he would not enter into heaven. Because there is another point in the condition which he would have violated. Unless a man be born of the spirit, 
he cannot see the kingdom of God. Amen for Pastor Spurgeon. Once again, Jesus tells us that Nicodemus, don't marvel at what I said. The reason Jesus stops at this moment is because Nicodemus is still stunned. Like most Jews of his time, they already believed that they had the inner transformation promised in the new covenant. Jesus basically says, look, I know you understand and follow the laws, but my father cares less about your rules and regulations. He wants a relationship, which you can only get by being born again. In verse 8, Jesus explains, you don't understand everything about the wind, but you see its effects. This is just how it is with the birth of the Spirit. Jesus wanted Nicodemus to know which he didn't understand everything about the new birth before he experienced it. Though man is made in God's image, yet the nature of God in every way infinitely transcends that of man. Both the thoughts and the acts of God surpass man's understanding. In the Old Testament, Isaiah says something very similar. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. Now, I know some of you saints know that's 55 and 8 through 9 through Isaiah. Verses 9 through 13, Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel? And do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and we testify what we have seen. And you do not receive our witness. Our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. Nicodemus, still clearly confused and stunned, by this revelation, can't believe he hasn't already experienced a new birth, like I said previously. Jesus humbles him even further by saying, how can you teach others when you clearly don't understand? The Old Testament and the scriptures that you've read numerous, numerous times and are familiar with since young. I sympathize with Nicodemus because I too have found new meaning in scriptures that I previously read. How many times have you read through something and and the first time you might have got one piece of it, but reading again, God showed you something completely different. A different text than you previously read. Isn't God amazing? Jesus then tells Nicodemus, how will you believe the heavenly things if you cannot even comprehend the earthly things? Finally, Jesus says, he actually answers Nicodemus' question. But he's so stunned, he doesn't even realize it. He said, yes, I am the Messiah. In essence, Jesus is saying, I am the word who was in the beginning and who became flesh to be a light for all men. In verses 14 through 15, Moses, as, as he explains, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. That whoever belong, believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Jesus makes a remarkable statement that the new birth is solidified by two acts. The first act is you must be lifted up like a serpent in the wilderness. We find this, this story back in Numbers. The bronze servant, serpent, which was used to bring healing to the nation of Israel after they complained about being brought up out of Egypt. Can you imagine that? Complaining about being enslaved. God rescues you and you're still complaining. God disciplined them by sending these fiery serpents to plague them in order to reverse the curse. God told Moses to make a bronze image of a serpent and to place it upon a pole and to raise it in the midst of the people. Any person who looked upon the lifted serpent would be healed. The bronze serpent here represents sin judged by God Almighty. In the same way, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us on the cross and our sin was judged in him. A bronze serpent in this picture is, is, is a sign of, of sin that was God had judged and dealt with. As it says in Isaiah 45 and 22, look to me and be saved and all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. We might be willing to do a hundred things to earn our salvation, but God commands us to only trust in him, to look to him. This term lifted up is used to describe both Jesus' crucifixion in John 12 and 32 and his ascension in Acts 2 and 33. 
Both meanings are, are in view, his suffering and his exaltation. Jesus was lifted up in both ways. The idea behind eternal life means more than a long or never-ending life. Eternal life does not mean that this life goes on forever. Instead, eternal life also has the idea of a certain quality of life, of God's kind of life. It is the kind of life enjoyed in eternity. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. We're going to continue on with the revelations that we are getting through John. Amen. I'll be coming from John 3, 16 through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever so believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe it is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil, for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, and that they have been done in God. Amen? Amen. Real love, unconditional love, is a gift which comes from God and God alone. Whereas hate is a gift that comes from Satan. For he loves nothing. Let me explain. True selfish love is a gift which only comes from the Lord who loves us with an everlasting love. And those who claim to love him must be love as God is love. Must give love as God gives love. Whereas hate is a gift which can only come from Satan as he was the first hater from the beginning. Satan has no love for anyone, especially human beings who are made in God's image. Amen? Verse 16, for God so loved the world. I just want to expound for a second on that. God so loved the world. What I want you to focus on is the word so throughout this talking. Because there's a difference when somebody so loves you. Then when someone just says, I love you. The other day we were on the deck and Richard looked at me. He said, you know, and he didn't even know this is what's going on. But he said, you know, after all these years, I'm still so in love with you. Amen. That made me feel real good. Because when you're so in love with somebody, you devote everything you have to them. When you're so in love with them. Now, because I love you. I'll take you to Starbucks, Pastor Dana. You know, Heather, I'll share the next time I cook the curry scallops. That's when, when I love you. But when I so love you, I'm going to move heaven and earth for you when I so love you. See, God so loved us. How do you know if someone loves you? Well, sometimes it's hard and they have to make tough decisions that they feel they must do right, even if it's hurting and sacrificial. When it's true, serving others rule over serving self. Serving others and loving others rules over your personal wants. That's when you so love somebody. You give them the best of yourselves, and most often, it's at a cost. Amen? It's at a cost, most often. God so loved us that he sent his only son, which was the ultimate act of love. We read it, but we don't get the so loved part. It's the so loved part. I know I got to stay here, Missy, I know. Whew. We were created in his image. 
We are special. When someone says, oh, you think you're special? Yes, I do. Because I'm so loved. And I'm so loved that he created me in his image. And by creating me in his image, he wanted to love me and save me so much that he said, his son. Amen. To save me from this vile and awful world. He so loved me. No matter what our lot in life is, God loves us. And there's proof of it. He lives. He lives. I'm so glad he lives. The proof is his son. He was clothed in flesh and dwelt among men. His sacrifice was for all and just not some. Amen? The Jews during that time could not understand this, and many professing believers today still don't understand this magnificent love because they just think it's for them or their class or their religion or their race. Amen? But no, it's the world. Somebody ought to say amen. <laughs> but if the word of God is the truth of us Christians who believe it, we must walk in truth. We must reconcile ourselves universally and get that he so loved the world. That means you and me and everybody else. The world. Hallelujah. We have to walk in it. Sometimes it's a hard thing for certain people to accept and to, to walk in this liberty, but it's free. He so, loved us up that, he so loved us that he gave us the best. And some still don't get it. He so loved us. Amen. That he gave his best for a sin offering. Not all the religious believed not all the uh, passer buyers believed, but God still sent his son to save them all. God, through his son, offers freedom from sin and salvation to all whosoever believes. However, back in the day, they didn't want to share that belief. A little, they were a little selfish. And sometimes we can get a little selfish. Amen. I don't like sharing my bacon. I'm selfish because I love bacon, but I'm not so in love with bacon that I'll forsake you and let you be hungry that you shouldn't eat either. Amen. I know some of y'all are trying to figure this out. It's okay. Though the thought is how can God love the immoral, the bigot, etc. Well, he loves the world. God did not send his son for one class, color, type of person, short, tall, skinny, fat, big, little, white, black. He didn't send it. He sent it for us so that we may come to know him in the pain of his suffering and in the fellowship of his resurrection. He wants us to know him. But still some choose to be blind. He didn't come into the world to lock us up and, and condemn us, as it, you know, in verse 17. He didn't do that. He didn't come into the world to, to uh, make us want to scurry away and, and, and balk at him. He came into the world so that we can change not only on the outside, but on the inside. That transformation love is what God had. But hearts were so hardened that they couldn't even understand it then because they were selfish. They were selfish. Some of us today are still selfish that we don't want others to go free and get out of bondage because we just think it's ours. The world is selfish, but God's love is an everlasting, delivering, freeing kind of love. We're naturally immoral people. We're valent affections, our wants and our desires, yet he loves us. He loves the adulterer, the murderer, the abuser, the drinker, the oppressor, the bitter and vengeful. You know, the kind of folks that make up the world, the kind of folks that we sometimes as Christians walk by and kind of just snub our noses at. He loves them. Just like he loves us. It is in this world that he loved us so much that Christ said, okay, I'll give it all up and come down. If that's what you want, Father, I'll give it all up and come down. To save him, her, and the other, I'll give it all up and come down. 
They might not like me at first. They, not, they might not receive me at first. They might not even want to sit down and talk to me at first. But you know what? Still, because of your love, I will come down. The believer acknowledged the light, accepted the light, and now has eternal life. The believer is washed and cleansed and forgiven. The believer has tried the world and figured it out it didn't work. It didn't give peace, or the believer would still be in there. Ephesians 4, 5 through 6 says there's one body and one spirit, just as you're called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. You can't get around it. He so loved the world. God's love is the kind of love that we cannot quite comprehend or fathom. We can't quite wrap our head around it. You see, the height of it, he so loved us. The, the, the depth of it, well, the height of it is that he loved us. The depth of it is he so loved us. The length of it is that he gave, God gave to us. And the breadth of it is whosoever. That's how far out it goes, whosoever. Aren't you glad you're a whosoever? Hallelujah, whosoever. That's how wide it goes. That's the vastness of it. We ought to be praising God about that. Hallelujah. There is no salvation in any other, for no other name under heaven um, can save among, no other name under heaven among men whereby we can be saved. We get forgiveness, we get salvation, and we get eternal life. Now, I don't know what gets better than that. I really don't. I just really don't. I don't even want to, mm-mm, don't care. What else can express a love like this aside of what God's given us? No other work can display this type of affection. No other adoration. No other love can do what this love did for us. No words or cards or trinkets or, to or tokens can adequately express the kind of love God has given to us. No acts of service or kindness that mankind can ever think of or conjure will ever compare to God's love. Ever. You can, you can buy the moon and back. No pun intended. But it's still not enough. Hallelujah. To be a sinner saved by grace is the best gift you could have ever received. And God, through his son, made a way. Somebody ought to praise God. He so loved you. Those who, let's talk about the other type of person, the unbeliever. Those who allow sensual and evil desires to rule over them rather than the love of God. Those who try to navigate their own way through life, refusing to take the path that God has already set out through his son, Jesus Christ. So tell you see, you're going to hear me repeat, I'm talking about two types of people. Not two race of people. Amen? Not classes of people, but types of people. These are the people of the world that think this way. You know, you remember when you're greedy and selfish, wanting to feed our own desires. I know I was. At times I still do. That's why I have to pray. There's a rock group. Their name is Hoser. And they have a song called Take Me to Church. Some of the lyrics go like this. I was born sick. But I love it. Command me to be made well. Amen. Amen. Take me to church and I'll worship like a dog. At the shrine of your lies, I'll tell you my sins and you can sharpen your knife. Offer me that deathless death. Good God, let me give you my life. Now this is what he's saying to the world. His church is the world. Let me... Live that deathless death. I said, you know not what you speak of, sir. Because that's not a place where you want to go. But that's what the world looks, looks, looks to, that, that, that thing that, that they, they can't fulfill, that they keep searching and digging only to lead them to death. 
The world church is the church for the unbelieving, fulfilling carnal lust and desires. With zero accountability and where passion and appetites are satisfied carnally, costing them their lives spiritually and spiritually and spirits physically and sometimes unbeknownst to them. The person does not want to let go of, of what it is that has him bound, and he believes the lies and continue falls before the sharpened knife leading him to death, a deathless death, which is hell. They would rather live in the dark than come to the light and turn to Christ. Worldly living is a losing battle, yet so many are blinded by the glam and glitter of it that they cannot see the true light, and there's only one true light, and that is Jesus Christ. So the wicked flee from the light. They balk at the presence of Christ. They shun at the message of his word. And the light, when it shines on them, they scurry because darkness is better. You remember at the party, it got started when it got dark. When they turned the lights off, that's when it got started. You know why? Because you're feeding the flesh at that time. And can't nobody see, so you think. The light exposes the true heart and nature of man. Things that can be hidden are revealed, thoughts are shared, made manifest, and wickedness is called into account. The condemned, for the condemned, such a thing is hard to face. You ever find something hard to face sometimes? You know you could do better. You know you should stop doing it. You know you should stop saying it, but you keep doing it anyway because it's hard. It's hard. And sometimes it's so hard that they, don't, they keep feeding themselves with the lies of the world, choosing not to turn. Matthew Henry, in his commentary, stated, Man's apostasy began in an affection for forbidden knowledge, but is kept up by an affection for forbidden ignorance. I, yeah, I had to sit up when I read that myself. But tonight... Let us see that ignorance is not bliss. We can't just go prancing through the tulips. We have to walk in the light of God. For everyone practicing evil, verse 20, haste the light and does not come to light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But what he does, but he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen and that they be done in God. If you have not realized by now, there are only two classes of people, the believer, the underbeliever, those who walk in darkness and those who walk in light, the condemned and the non-condemned. Don't worry about who, who, who's going to heaven. When you see there, it ain't going to be nothing like you think. Amen? But I do know this. There's going to be many people clothed in white in, from many nations with many tongues singing glory to God for the salvation in which he gave us. That's what's important. And until you get that, until you get that he came to save a world, you're still lost. You have to understand there's no black, there's no white, there's no this, and there's no that. There's just one God, one Father, one Holy Spirit, one word for one class of people, and that is the believers. As a church, we have to pray for the unbeliever. We have to walk this love out loud of God. We have to walk it out loud. We have, to, we have to sing it. We have to show it. We should love our enemies so much that we don't want them to perish. The bigot so much we don't want him to perish. The oppressor so much we don't want them to perish, but we want them to come to light. That's how important this is. God is good. I didn't mean to get on that, but I got to understand the unrenewed or the untransformed soul cannot do right without the love of God. No matter, you said the words, the Bible says, though a man thinking he might be right in his own, in his mind, in his own ways, but in the end it leads to destruction. No, the unrenewed mind can't think right, can't do right, can't act right, can't talk right, can't pray right, can't do nothing right. We need to be so loved. Hallelujah, the believer without Christ is an alien, far from God's people. And the promises of God without hope. The unbeliever loves his or her sin and does not receive it. We have to pray for them that they turn to the true love. 
Let us therefore preach and teach it. Let us walk it. That none shall perish, because that is his will. Amen. Remember, there's no color, no class, no gender. There's no leading gender, no, no leading race. There's no leading. No, no, no. There's only one leader, and that's the Father in heaven. Let's pray for the believer. Let's pray for ourselves. And remember, when you're so loved, it encourages you, it inspires you, it comforts, it heals, and it saves, and it gives you eternal life. Therefore, there is no, now no condemnation for those who walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. You are loved, you are in whosoever, and you have eternal life. Amen. The revelation of Jesus, the new master. John 3, verses 22 to 36. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Aden near Selim, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose disputes between some of John's disciples and Jesus about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you had, have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase and I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Jesus came from heaven. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receiveth his testimony. He who has received the, this, his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. I don't know about you, but sometimes we get to the place where we get ready to go travel. We travel and we don't know exactly where we're going. But when we get there, we have to let God do the work in you that needs to be done. Sometimes you have to let your servitude uh, go at that moment and say, Lord, here I am. Uh, and I know you're with me for what you're about to do. So when you travel, you don't know sometimes where you're going, but wherever you go, remember that God is with you in everything that he does. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Here, in chapter, in verse 22 here, it says that after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. This was just when Jesus has just finished his conversation that he had with Nicodemus. And because of that, he had left Jerusalem and went to Judea. And when he went to Judea, he went and he was going to, they say that he was going to baptize. But it wasn't Jesus himself who actually baptized. It was his disciples who baptized him. You can find that in John 4 and 2. Now it says in verse, now John also was baptized in Aden near Selim. Because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. What this verse is telling us is to get us prepared for how God is about to use us in the things that we go in the areas that we go into. Even though Judea and Anan was not close, were close uh, around in Samaria, no one really knew the true story of what Anan was all about. But this was a place that God had sent John to. And when John had got there, John was there, there was much water there. And that was the main reason why he was there. I don't know if God called him to go there, but for some particular reason, John went there. And that caused it was a lot of water. 
And as you can remember, uh, if this place was maybe about 20 miles away from where Jesus had, uh, John and Jesus was at. And because of this, that meant that neither one of them knew who was where. But on top of all of that, John was not using just a little water to sprinkle. He needed a lot of water. He actually emerged you into, your, into that water. He took you down. He didn't take water and just sprinkle it on you. So he knew that he needed a lot of water where he was going. That's just like in, in, in Matthew uh, 3 and 14. That's when Jesus came to John the Baptist. And when John the Baptist uh, baptized him, what Jesus did was that he was emerged in the water and he came up out of that water. And the Holy Ghost was on him at that time. And this was the per one of the reasons for the baptism there. But not only that, though, John had not yet been thrown into prison. That means that he still had a little bit more time on his tail. In verse 25, he says, Then there arose disputes between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. If you know anything about what purification was during that particular time, it meant a whole lot. Because even in the Old Testament, the purification was needed with the children of Israel. But here, John is speaking with the Jews, not just the people, but he's speaking to the religious Jews here. And what he's telling them is that they are having a dispute with John and his disciples about purification that has to do with baptizing. The Jews baptized before John, uh, the Baptists begin to baptize. They use a ceremonial pool that was associated with the worship temple. They call it Mechavik. They were filled with, they filled it with water and they would emerge themselves in the water and come up out of the water. And it was a symbol of the cleansing and the coming before God. That is how they cleansed themselves. And this was a sacrifice for repentance and the cleansing and a cleansing state for them. It did, they did it before God. That meant that they would leave in their life behind. That's what they believed in as Jews. So they were discussing now this neon say thing about with the Jewish religious leaders though, about their purification and the baptizing about what they were doing with John. This was an issue because a lot of times people have issues with how you're being baptized and how you receive the Lord as your Lord and Savior. But John wanted them, but the, 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 the John, John's uh, disciples, what they seemed to understand was that the, the uh, Jews were basically trying to confuse them on some things. And because of that confusion, they, they got a little bit disturbed because of what they were saying. And that because of this dis disturbment, disturbance, he said, you see, you have a nice group of congregations here, is what the Jews was telling them. But you have this man, Jesus, whom you had testified for, who's bringing more disciples than you are. And because of that, that becomes an issue for the uh, disciples. It wasn't a real issue for the Jews. They just wanted to create an issue because the devil loves to create havoc. But not only that, he said in, in, in verse 27, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. So John here is defending Christ. God is in control of everything. God knows just what he is doing, and John refused to let them put him on a pedestal. John has given them a lesson on how to serve in an area that God called him in. Don't worry about what uh, you are not doing, he says. A man doesn't get anything unless it comes from God. Anything and everything, he says, that I have come from God. God uses us for that purpose and time. John was letting them know how he blesses other people and picks them up so that they will be able to go on. God is up, is up, is left up to God what he does with you. It's not up to John, he was saying. John says if he decides to do one thing or one or, or another thing, he says it's entirely up to God. It's not up to him. What makes you different from another and what you do have and what makes you different from another and what you do, you have not received 
Now, if you did receive it, he says, why do you glory as if you have not received it? Then he let them know, for yourselves bear me, he says, yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. John uses this particular opportunity to tell them once again that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He said, I told you that I was not the Christ. He says, so when people come to you, and, but when, when people don't come to me, he says, but they go to Christ instead, he says, I'm not troubled by that. That is not my ministry, and this is what I have been called to do. I am just a forerunner for him. He who has a bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him Rejoice greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. I really want you to get this one right here. This bridegroom. Jesus is the bridegroom. John is just the best man. He's the friend. So he's not threatened that Jesus is getting this bride. They were trying to make him feel threatened because the bride had eyes for the groom. The bride is supposed to have eyes for the groom and not for the best man. It is a bad scene if the bride has eyes for the best man. The best man is just standing there with the groom at the wedding reception and he's not threatening that the groom ends up with the bride. It's not a threat to him. Because that's what he wants to see. Because he is what he came, that's what he actually came to see. That was his role. That is his position. He's not to be uh, uh, out in front to do anything. He's there to work with the bridegroom. He's to push him out in front. He's to move back. And in order for him to move back, he says, he must increase and I must decrease. Jesus must increase. He says, I must decrease. John recognized his servitude. He recognized what his role and position was with Christ already. He was not going to allow these religious Jewish people to persuade him that Jesus was any better than he was. He understood that the only way that Jesus got what he got was that he came from the Father himself and that he had received it. But not only that, Jesus, he said, must increase, and I must decrease. John is not trying to draw any type of attention to himself. Matter of fact, he was glad that people was going to Christ. Amen. And more than that, he, would, he wanted them to come to Jesus, and he already knew his place because he wanted them to come to Jesus. He knew the place that he was, that he had. And I'm not, and I am more than, and I'm, and, and I am more than will to let him be in front. Meaning that he's more than willing to let him be in front. Are you willing to let those, uh, some people be in front of you on some things? Are you willing to allow yourself to decrease so that someone else can increase? John knew that this was his ministry and that it was uh, uh, essential. It was a testimony by itself to the ministry of John the Baptist. Amen. So as Jesus increased, it was necessary for John to decrease. Right, right. So that if in verse 31 he says, if he who comes from above is above all, he who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Jesus came from heaven. Now, look at what John is telling us now. John did not come from heaven. Jesus is above all of us. I'm not threatened by him, he says. He says, but how can I compete with him? Even if he could, he says, or if he wanted to. He says, he comes from above. He says, John says, I'm just a man. Born of a woman and a man. I speak the things that are on the earth and the things that are earthly. He's from above. 
He says, and he says, I get my message from God. Okay? But it's no better than the fact that when he says, and when he has seen and heard, and that he testifies, no one receives him. That means, and even though John, in the 31st verse here, he says, Jesus came from heaven. Here in the 32nd verse, he's saying that what and what he has seen and heard, that means what Jesus has seen and heard, he can testify for because he is from above. John is admitting to the fact that he is not from above. So he's willing to step aside and allow Jesus to come in front. He says he comes from heaven with a message and he declares what he has seen and heard with his own eyes and own ears. He comes as the God, the son of the eyewitness of one. He witnessed heaven himself. He can speak of heavenly things. He can talk of the heavenly things. He can tell you what his father is doing in sin because he came from above. What a God we serve. And you won't even accept his testimony, he says. He is rebuking them at this time. Because he understands already what the role that he's in. Everybody can't be in the front. Here he says in verse 33, he says, He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. Mm. Mm. John said that I received Jesus' testimony. I'm telling you that I received Jesus' testimony. And I certify that he is true in my life. He has been everything that he said he was going to be, and he's even every, everything he said he is in the human life to me. The one who does receive Jesus Christ, he says, certifies that God's word is true. He has changed you totally once you accept him into your life. I know you have the same testimony too. In verse 34, he says, For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the spirit by measure. Saints, God does not give the spirit by measure. Jesus had the Holy Spirit upon him in a way that no other person ever did or ever will. Jesus was sent by God. Jesus' words are the words of God himself. The devil doesn't want you to hear these words, but Jesus has the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God on him. He didn't tell Jesus to just to take a little power, take a little of my presence. No, he was not limited at anything that form, shape, or fashion, he said. What he did was that Jesus alone had the full measure of the, of the presence of God. Amen. He had the calling. He was being equipped. He was being blessed. He had the fullness, and he was appointed to work. That means that anything that God has called you to do, he's already equipped you to do what you need to do. So there's no reason for you to doubt in your mind that God will not do it for you. You have to believe in the Son of God and believe in your heart that he'll do exactly what you ask him to do. He says the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. They have a special relationship. He's got a special relationship between the Father and the Son. And you, he's telling them, are rejecting him. And says the one who loves the Father, you want to reject. They have a close relationship. Remember in Matthew 17, just a paraphrase here, uh, God shares with his disciples that close relationship that he had. When Peter was on the mountain and the, all of a sudden a bright light came on him, and uh, who was it? Moses and Elias was there. But the bright Jesus, God appeared and said, Behold, this is whom I am well pleased Hear him. This is the only son. This is his only son. This is his only begotten son. He loved his son because he gave him all power. He gave him all authority. There was nothing that he could not give him. And he says in verse 36, he says, He who believes in the son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the son shall not see life. 
but the wrath of God abideth in him. Listen, saints, you got two choices. You got everlasting life and you got everlasting damnation. And this is the basis upon one single thing. He says, what you decide to do with the father's son and what you decide to do with the father's son, you will be held accountable or you will be made responsible for your actions. It's important of believing, it's important to believing unto your salvation. Otherwise, he says, the wrath of God abides on you and it just sits there. It sits there. And it's life that makes a curse on you. It's a life that will become a curse for you. The wrath of God is something that you don't want to see. God's wrath is real. It's active. God is holy. He's righteous. And pure as well as loving. He's gracious. He's merciful. He executes judgment, judgment as well as love. He shows wrath and anger as well as compassion. His wrath is both present and future. God's wrath will be especially manifested and active in these last days. Amen. Oh, when I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost and how he healed me to the uttermost.